for it. Uh, well, let's keep it short so that, you know, the other guys can. Uh, so uh, I'm going to. So, <clears throat> okay. I am trying to learn. I'm trying to uh, dip my toes into some particular styles. Uh -huh. And I just wanted to ask you if what I planned as my strategy to try to emulate these styles is, you know, is uh, good. Oh, good is such a not right word, not the word I was looking for. But anyway, so I'm trying first. I'm trying to learn how to paint with uh, crazy neon colors. Um, like sort of to emulate that uh, retro futuristic kind of aesthetic. Uh, so the way I th thought I should go about it is find images that are representative. Uh, and well, first, obviously, I'm going to look at the values system, how, how the values are uh, organized in those paintings. And then just, uh, you know, look at the colors that they use. And I thought the best, the best way to teach myself how to do these paintings is to, to paint something in values first and then use uh, layer modes to put neon colors over them and see if that works. What do you think? Um, yeah, okay, so what's the goal of this strategy? Um, like the overarching goal? It's basically just to learn, to train my eye to kind of paint, maybe directly using crazy neon colors without having to go through this whole process of understanding what's behind, you know, what, you know like just do it straight into color, but with crazy kind of colors. Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I ask only because I think it's important to have the context of what the goal is. And so the goal is to just um, to have better colors. I'm always, I'm always a fan of getting to the fundamentals, but I do also uh, appreciate like having, um, having like different kinds of strategies to try to achieve certain things that you're just, you're just not skilled enough to do. Right. Like, like for, for example, when I was suggesting to Stefan, like to, to use more 3d in the mm -hmm. work as a supplement for, um, uh, what you call it for his lack of painting ability at the moment. Yeah. yeah. It's the same kind of philosophy I would have like, okay, maybe you have a hard time painting colors straight up, but uh, you can do this for now, but it, when time comes, you should you should definitely um, you should definitely just learn how to uh, what you got like paint colors like more deliberately. So like short term, yeah, let's do it. Long term, try to like make it part of your regimen to get better at painting colors. Uh, I did this too, man. Like I actually like spent like a good portion of like um 2017 2018 all i did was just like practice um painting um what you call it like just in colors like you can even see it in my art station where i just was doing a lot of color paintings yeah and uh, yeah, that was the main that. yeah that was just the main focus there and so that's kind of what i'm trying to get at and so uh but yeah like but anything in between to just kind of get you comfortable like yeah i'm always in, the f in favor of this type of stuff okay okay yeah and uh, there's another style that i'm trying to uh, learn how to emulate which is kind of like the uh, anime sort of uh illustration whatever thing uh i believe uh, that guy that works for Riot, Snappy, Ate Galan, I don't know how to pronounce his name. He's pretty famous. Uh, he has a lot of the paintings. Yeah, that guy. He has a lot of the paintings in that style. And I think he inspired me to, well, that and the fact that I watch a lot of anime. So 
the way I thought I should go about that is again just take representative images in that style, maybe even screenshots from anime that I like as a, mm-hmm. as an aesthetic, and try to you know study the well the value structure, the contrast, the the colors, um, and just the, the the kind of brushwork that is used. I, I guess and you know is that. Would that be effective? I think. I mean, do you think that's that's that would be enough to, you know? Well, I usually recommend whenever studying any style that's not your own to mm-hmm. just gather lots and lots of reference. And so he he or she might be a good starting point to kind of just get that ball rolling. But ultimately, mm-hmm. you you should be looking at like anybody else that comes close to that type of aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Uh, does that make that's sense? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because if you only look at that one artist, there's a, there's a there's a chance that you might just get stuck with um, that person's style, mm, and end up copying it. You know. Yeah, and so, but if you want to like get some of that into your work, you gotta like still look at it. And so, um, but I usually recommend looking at all sorts of stuff to kind of push mm-hmm. push that ability a little bit yeah. further. So in that sense, it, it would be okay to to study f- also from screenshots, right? Like pause an anime, take a screenshot, and make a study of a particular scene that looks Yeah, so so here's the way you should think about about this, all of this. Hmm. Okay. As long as you're not stealing, like calling oh. it your own work, anything oh, and everything yeah. you do is mm-hmm. is fair game. Okay. okay. Right? Like I think there's a lot of stigma of like copying, but if you're just copying to learn right like yeah, as one of the yeah. tools to help you learn uh then do it if you're if you're copying to steal then don't do that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if you're only copying uh, i would highly uh recommend against that as well because it's not effective just to copy you would also, yeah, also know. to do tests and studies yeah but, but copying is a great tool uh in the arsenal of tools mm-hmm. to, get, to getting better that yeah, thing called I think I watched your uh, video on that about like twenty times. So, yeah, yeah, I need to upgrade it though. I think that I think people are all together just not studying with copying. <laughs> I, I I'm almost certain that I mentioned copying is just not the most effective, but I could be wrong. But the the updated version for sure, it's going to be very explicit <laughs> that <laughs> it's just another tool like a hammer and a screwdriver or needed yeah. to put together a table. If, uh, if you only have a hammer or if you only have a screwdriver, the parts that would need a hammer or a screwdriver are going to be harder to, mm-hmm. to figure out. Yeah. Well, okay. For now, I'm going to let somebody else speak. But thanks. thanks yeah, get that. out of here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a question regarding more freelance stuff. Um, Move to Serbia. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Become a Serbian bastard. <laughs> um, when, when America, if America uh, elects Donald Trump again, which is, which is not off the table, which is crazy to me that it, it's not off the table. I, I am highly optimistic. I think that he is going to be voted out for sure. But there is a still a pretty good chance that... Um, people will form out of spite of the woke culture. There's like a culture of woke people and they are making people, um, they're making people just hate that and they're like voting against their best interest out of spite and that's incredibly unintelligent. But if, if that does happen, uh, I'm going to move to Serbia. <laughs> just kidding. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move somewhere though. I'm thinking about like just getting out of here. Like I'm just like, you know what? I love this country, but dude, at some point, you know, it's like I can't deal with this stuff. I understand. Anyways, continue. Um, I was gonna ask um, if about I the freelance. Sh- yes, about the freelance. Um, how do you feel about posting on places outside of Instagram and Twitter and our station? just for the sake of getting more views? Like, I understand it sounds like a, it almost sounds like an obvious Stupid answer. Stupid something, I'm just kidding. 
you greedy like, what, motherfucker. Do you, do you feel that I should be following the work smarter approach or should I follow the work harder approach when it comes to like shotgunning my stuff out to the world? I'm all about smarter, dude. Have you okay. not taken a month of my class? What the hell? <laughs> it's all about smarter. Harder is just part of the smart play. The play is always do what's best, right? Right. And in, in the case of getting better as a concept artist, it is doing the hard stuff. You know what I mean? Right. That that's usually why people fail. It's not that um, it's not that there's like some sort of secret that I'm not sharing with you guys. It's it's like I just had like a miniature motivational speech earlier, right? About like like just keeping with it, you know? Right. Um but that is the smarter approach. The smarter approach is to learn your fundamentals, to learn how to be a better artist, to study and practice effectively. That is the approach. Um, and so when it comes to uh, freelance and posting on all sorts of social medias, the, the answer to that is also very, very clear. It's you, you share your work <clears throat> everywhere that you can afford to share it on. You want to have more exposure to what you do absolutely okay right I, I made a tiktok account you know what i mean like okay i don't give a <laughs> fuck dude and so it's like <laughs> for real yeah i have a tiktok account. <laughs> i don't do any of the tiktok stuff i do like just um there i think there's one video somewhat like a tiktok ish feeling vibe but it's still uh like relevant to what i do because you don't want to like advertise a different like if you, you go on there like Hey guys, it's me or whatever. Like the YouTube kind of freaking thing. It's your boy. It's your boy, AJ, <laughs> coming down with the beats. Here yeah. we go. Here's the newest pencil from Wacom. Let me show you how it works. You know, I don't talk or act like that. And if I build a whole business around this strategy, then I'll never be genuine. And I will fall into this trap of like having to constantly make content like this. Right. You know? Uh, all of my content is relatively what I would do. Um, there's very few things, if there's any, where I have a different persona, if that makes sense. And so my advice usually when it comes to all this stuff is that when you are sharing and you're, you're putting your artwork out there, it should be reflective of what you are. Like, like social media, one of the, the main criticisms is that people don't act like themselves. Like they act like something, a fake version of themselves. Right. Uh, and that works, dude. That works really well, right? That's why people do it. But in the long in the long game, it's not the best strategy. Not for your health. Uh, not for your freelance life, right? Like you want to, you don't want. Like I told you earlier, like it's not about money. It's about time, right? Right. Uh, and so if you just want to make a decent living and you don't really care for all that fame and all that stuff, like you just want to be happy with what you have. Right again, life's still gonna throw curveballs and fuck you up every once in a while, but but ultimately you are happy. Like I'm ultimately happy, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if that's what you want, then just be yourself, but post often. Post often. That's the strat. Okay. Is that you just post your work as often as you can. Uh, anybody and everybody that I just give this suggestion to, they're always a little skeptical at first, but as they start to do it, they start to get more fans they start to get more job offers almost immediately you know um, especially with tools like artstation that are built for this they've built a really good platform to help us artists out you know they are great you know they're only growing so who's who knows how that growth will ultimately affect their strategies but but as of now their their morals and their ethics are in the right place at least as far as i can tell and so uh, this is this is basically my advice. <laughs> you guys are trying to get me to move out to <laughs> come to my country. Um, but yeah, you get it. Yes. Cool. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, but like, don't don't be afraid of posting on places that you think people will be like, "What?" You, you might accidentally stumble upon something. Uh, I was talking to one of my uh, friends. Logan Prisha, like he, um, he, he was one of the kind of guys that would make a lot of complaints about the industry and about like, he's one of those folks. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, one day he reached out to me, he was just talking to me and we were having a conversation and then he came to realize that 
a lot of that is just kind of toxic. It's not really helping him in any real way. And I gave him the advice I just gave you. I'm like, you got to share more often. You're not sharing at all, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so like nobody's going to know, right? Nobody is going to know um, who you are. And so he started posting more often and sure enough, he got, started getting more opportunities just because he's, he's already really good. And um, those opportunities started to flourish. And then he started posting on um, places like Twitter, he said. And as soon as he started posting on Twitter, he uh, started getting all sorts of commission jobs. And he said it's been actually working out pretty great. And I'm pretty happy to hear about that. Like, that's really cool. Um, but he, he found that Twitter really works for him and what he does. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, great. That's, but that's, that's the, the testament to posting all over the place, you know, versus just posting... Um, one place only right. you're building more roads to your your place i'll oh, see you see you later uh nerdy breland oh see you dude <laughs> yeah have a good one i think you already rolled out but it was, it was an honor to have you in the class man i appreciate you oh uh, he said he has two questions for you okay i'll let i'll let someone speak for him but just to finish my point um yeah you just gotta you gotta post often and um, consistently okay, okay. all right <clears throat> uh what was his questions can someone read them out loud for me um so only question i have <clears throat> only questions ha i have for aj as a freelance is as a freelance uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you you, you feel yeah feel free to like fill what in is, the gaps of his what is two like, tips <laughs> Two tips you would give to your younger self to get a jump start in the concept art industry. Thank there you, you Jesus. <laughs> we just all have to move to Serbia. That's the solution here. That's the that's my tip. That's move to tip. Serbia. <laughs> tip one. Tip two. Move to Serbia. <laughs> uh, no. Um, if I had to, the the thing is, is that like you know. Uh, there, there's really, really anything that I would tell my past self. I've been asked this question before because the past self needed to go through the things that they did to be the current self, right? And so it's, it's, it's a, it's one of those questions that's like, it's a hard one, but there is some things that I, I think that if I would have told myself, it wouldn't have been as, like, it wouldn't have derailed me too much. In fact, it, might, it probably would have a positive influence in my life. Um, which is managing your finances more effectively. In fact, uh, looking into uh, having an accountant, having a tax person, all that stuff, especially if you can afford it uh, and have them manage and do all that stuff, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, and another one is don't take more jobs than you can handle. Uh, those are probably the two tips that I think I can give to myself in the past that would still keep me on the right path and potentially would have improved my quality of life uh, ultimately. But that's it. Uh, I don't really want to get too like butterfly effect because it's one of those things that I do that and I go back in time and then I come back to the future and then now I'm like um, I'm armless. I'm like, what? What happened? Um, how the hell? <laughs> like, well, you you got a financial person, but you were still so naive. You didn't know any better. You actually worked with the mob. <laughs> I'm like, what? Oh man. Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, you know, there's always a thing. It's like, it's really hard to determine exactly. But I, I highly doubt that that would happen, but it's just like, it's like, I don't know, man. I really I can't say. <laughs> Jesus, that turned dark. But that's kind of the point of like, um, that was like an end game, right? Like the whole idea was that there's going to be parallel universes, like a ripple in time type of effect. And I don't want to do that because I do kind of like all the stuff that I have currently. So anyway, any other questions? I have a question. Uh, yeah, with, uh, um, Stop sorry. snapping your neck. <laughs> no, that's my fingers. I do that when I'm trying, when I lose <laughs> thought, sorry. Um, <laughs> with portfolios and that, how would you... Um, I oh, know how how would you say would be a good way to lay out portfolio more professional? Oh, that? yeah, that's a great that's a great question actually. Um, generally, I said just look at other people's portfolios, 
uh, especially in the genre in which you want to work in, you know, okay. and take notes from that. But uh, generally speaking, you want to demonstrate that you can iterate, you can make changes rapidly. These types of things are really valuable. So like, you know, all those right. thumbnails and sketches that you guys have done for my class, yep. those would have value in a portfolio. But then you also want to show that you can complete those designs. So then having the more completed stuff that I've asked of you guys to try to do uh, yep. is also quite important. Um, you know? And so, so to me, that's pretty much the, the biggest things, but like you also just stick to what you think people would want to see in your portfolio. Like, so if you're applying for Naughty Dog, maybe they don't want to see like all this over the top fantasy stuff. So then right. maybe, maybe if they give you feedback too, you might not like want to take it, uh, literally, Right, you want to like focus on the higher concept of what they might have not liked about your portfolio. Does that make sense? Um, but like, if you like have like a style that is akin to I don't know, like the Elder Scrolls games that I mentioned earlier, and that's mm -hmm. where you want to work. You love their games, and you do want to work there, and you did tell your portfolio there, and they're telling you all the reasons that's wrong with your portfolio. You should probably take that a lot more seriously. Right. Does that make sense. Um. I also encourage whenever you get portfolio reviews that if somebody tells you that you need more of something, uh, unless it's like directly correlated to your, your, the thing that you want to get better at. Like, so for instance, if you're a character designer and they say you should have more environments in your portfolio, I don't think that's good advice. Um, essentially what they're doing is they're just being really nice to you because you, you probably suck or they don't like your work a lot at all. Okay. And so, a, a great way to navigate that is just just straight up tell them, "Hey, listen, I I understand that my portfolio might not be as good as you want as a character designer. I uh, definitely got to go check the. Hold on, give me one second. Yeah, no worries. The dryer. Okay, I'm back. Uh, it's still going. I put an alarm just in case because I can't really hear it. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, ultimately, um, what I'm trying to say is that, like, if you have, like, a really good portfolio, they're, they're not going to say stuff like that. You know, they're not going to say, like, oh, you need more characters, you need more of this or more of whatever. Right. Oh. Uh, if but if it's like character related, like you need more iterations, you need more animation, you need more or animation keyframes or whatever that mm -hmm. makes sense within the the scope of your portfolio and what you are aiming for, then that that one you probably should take even more seriously. And the wow. reason why I I think it's important to to delineate is because when you when you go into these meetings and portfolio reviews, there's a there's a big chance that you might misunderstand that that that's what you need to do where honestly you just are not very good. Like if you were to show like a really good character concept artist to them, I don't think that they would say that to them, right? I don't think they say, oh, you need more environments if you showed right. them like Marco Djurjevic's character designs or any yeah. other badass concept artist, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're not gonna say these things. It's because he's not bad, he's really good, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so you have to then kind of force the hand a little bit if you think about it you have to kind of tell them, look, I get it. My work's not good, you know, like, or my work's not like suitable for your guys' standards um, as a character designer, you know, and I, I appreciate that. But what would, what would you guys really want to see from a character designer? You know, like just kind of force that, that critique, like have yeah. them really tear you apart. You want the, you want them to tell you how much and why you suck, you know? Mm -hmm. So that way you can focus on the right strategy. Because if you go the other way, you start practicing environments, you start doing that, and you have mediocre environments, then another critique you might hear is like, oh, you're, everything's just so bland. And like, like I can see you do characters, and you do a lot of them, and you're pretty decent at them. You should stick with that. Like, you should just focus on one thing. And then hearing bo both these types of perspectives will really confuse you, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so this is why I usually encourage people to just kind of tailor their portfolio to what they actually want to do, right? And pick a studio that you would actually like to work for. You may not work for them, but you may work adjacent, you know, like to a company that's very similar. Does right. that make sense? Yep. 
Uh, and that that's that might just be just as good. You might feel just as happy, you know. Okay. Yeah. And in fact, there's there's a case to be made that I, I think a lot of my friends who have worked at smaller studios have found more happiness than working for some larger studios. Uh, I'm pretty indifferent. I, I feel like I do fine wherever I'm at. Uh, only one time have I really genuinely hated where I was working, and it was working on the Monster Truck movie. Uh, other than that, I've been pretty happy with where I've been stationed in most situations. That's good. Yeah. But that's that's my overall advice on what to do about portfolio. And, and on uh, one step beyond that, how to uh, effectively think about portfolio reviews. All right, cheers. I have a question. Move to Syria. Yeah. I'm already here. <laughs> <laughs> move out of Syria and then move back to Syria. Serbia. <laughs> sorry, yeah. I'm sorry, Serbia. Yeah, I'm already yeah. here and Syria too. I'm in both places. Yeah, my <laughs> fault. <laughs> I know countries. Um, go ahead. Yeah, should I like aim for triple A companies or is it okay to start with a smaller company? I always <laughs> think that it's best to start with a triple A, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, well, maybe it's not so obvious, but like, um, just because you'll surround yourself with, with great artwork and you'll be challenged at a great level. Uh, but I also don't think it's bad to work at a smaller studio. Yeah. Um, like if you can't get any kind of job and a small studio reaches out to you and they're like, Hey, you know, we were willing to pay you and it's pretty good money. Um, you know, obviously don't be like, no, fuck you. AJ said only AAA. I discriminate. <laughs> How many A's you guys got? Half an A? Get out of here. You know? <clears throat> yeah, don't do not do that. But the, you should aim for like the big ones, right? Because not yeah. only is the money there, but the potential to get better is higher. Um, let me explain it to you this way. <clears throat> so imagine um, that you are uh, working for a big studio. You know, they'll sometimes have a large budget for artists, and you can take part of that budget between seventy-five to a hundred thousand dollars if you're really high caliber, right? <clears throat> this is this is nothing for them. It's only like you know, ten percent of the the cost of their main budget, right? And if they hire a really good concept artist, they're going to save a lot of money because then they can hire a bunch of like you know. Uh, grunt workers like contract modelers and stuff to make all the assets and stuff for very affordable like for much lower you know and it'll be faster because they don't have to pay them for a year they'll pay them for a few months so even this isn't like a yearly thing they can probably pay you this like within three or four months so it's like 25k or something like this you know yeah. uh, for like a few months of work potentially if you're working really good yeah now you take that with like a main larger studio where let's say they have a hundred thousand dollar i'm sorry a smaller studio but they have like a modest budget of a hundred thousand dollars to pay for their artists now they can't necessarily afford twenty five thousand for a few months of work because that's a quarter of their budget and they still might have like a year to make stuff right and unless they want to pay slave wages um they're the people that are going to build their assets are going to have to you know suck it up so what typically happens is they'll they'll pay people like thirty five to forty thousand dollars, and they'll hire like two, maybe three people, right, um, to work over a year on the same budget, right, and hoping that at towards the end of the year they can get some more money to cover the rest of the year more safely, or potentially get more money to pay for the next year and a half, right, for their remaining artists. <clears throat> right this is why you see a lot of studios try to hire a bunch of kind of like hybrid artists the kind of people that can do multiple stuff but here's the thing you're you would be surrounded by other mediocre artists you would be mediocre they would be me mediocre you know and so it's and you're working so it's really hard to get better in that kind of environment where if you're in an environment where you're working on triple a stuff and you're surrounded by triple a content and really high caliber art, right? You are you are exponentially getting better, and you're getting paid really well. So it makes perfect sense to just aim for the the stars, right? Because because even if you think of it this way, where I mean, 
let's say you hired like with the same budget, this million dollar budget, you'd hire like 10, 15 artists of this level, right? You think, well, just do that. Like hire a fucking work workforce of concept artists, right? Like 20 of them, whatever, right? At the very small cost of that yearly cost, right? Of a $45,000 salary. That that won't make your quality any better. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't make it any better if you have more mediocre artists. They don't add up to, it's not Voltron where they all come together and then make one badass concept artist, like three or four of them, right? One concept artist who's really good is really good. It's like uh, LeBron James, uh, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, just a team of three people versus all of us in, our, in this class, which is like a nine, nine person class. Like all nine of us are on the basketball court against these three monsters. We would still probably lose, you know? Cause they're some of the greatest athletes in that sport. Just because there's more of us doesn't mean that we can take them down, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, <clears throat> it's like whenever I play with my friends, or my kids' friends, like we play like tag or whatever, you know, like they have no chance, dude. They'll never fucking catch me. Like I let them catch me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if I really don't want them to catch. I just sprint straight in one direction and then done. I win, you know, <laughs> like there's, even if there's 20 of them, there's no way they're going to catch me. I mean, even if I just had like a slight jog, I could probably outpace them after a mile, you know? Yeah. They can run a lot, a lot, though. They're kids. They still have a lot of energy. Like, I would have to run quite a bit of distance. But I wouldn't be exerting a lot of energy compared to them. And so uh, that's, the way of, that's the way it feels like when you work for, like, a bigger bigger name. If that makes sense? Like, yeah. you feel like you're playing with the elites and you, you, are, you, need, a, you, need, you need to keep up. Um, but I, again, I don't advise against totally avoiding any kind of freelance life for a smaller or studio job for a smaller studio. Just keep in mind that it's not going to potentially make you any better. And yeah. so you need to do that outside of work. Like, so when you're done with work, you should still take classes. You should still watch tutorials. You should still build another portfolio that will get you out of that studio. Uh, if you love it and they pay you really well and you don't really care about doing mediocre work, right? Uh, and like I said, all those things are like, you just have a better quality of life. Right. Yeah. Um, then, then, you know, more power to you. Right. I actually wouldn't advise to do all the other stuff, uh, if that was the context, but the reality is, is that you should aim for a higher quality work, not just because you're, you're, it's like this kind of like capitalistic sentiment of like always accelerating. I actually don't think that's why you should do it. It's because of the capitalistic environment is why you should do it. Meaning that the industry constantly shifts and changes and you need to stand out to be able to survive in that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like it's not a matter of making and keep, keep making money. It's a matter of, uh, I'm sorry. It's not a matter of making lots and lots of money. It's a matter of that you can have a sustainable career. And a lot of my friends, I know they're not doing this shit and I'm really scared for them in the next five to six years. Uh, or actually, what was it? I, I was I predicting 2023. What is that? No, it's th that's like four years, almost three years. Yeah, 2023, 2024, we're going to see a huge shift, especially in the visual effects industry. And a lot of my friends are going to be out of jobs and they don't have any extra skills. That's bad. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I'm... Also thinking this is true for the video game industry, specifically modeling, um, animating, rigging. The only jobs that animators and stuff will have um, will be like unique animations and, and really bizarre and crazy styles of animations. But unfortunately, animation is not a style that you can recognize, obviously. Meaning that, like, do you know who animated uh, Up? Yeah, like, the no. animator who animated the, the old man versus the Asian boy? No. Do you know who animated the fish? Do you know how that, like, like, there's multiple animators animating that one film, but it's all kind of feels like one animator, right? Like, yeah. you think, well, that job won't go. No, you can machine learn that shit. <laughs> 
Like seriously, like they can like, it's not even like they would just go to the Maya files and do that. They would also just be able to just watch the raw footage of every animation and just put it all into this machine. And it will learn how to move people. And it'll just move them. Yeah. So the jobs that are gonna stay, like at least the last jobs to go is the kind of jobs that you guys are trying to aim for right now, concept art, right? Cause that is still incredibly challenging for a machine to do. And you could sue. If someone takes my style, right? Like I talked yeah. about this before, I can sue them and I should be able to win. Yeah, that, yeah. That's clearly my style. And you guys threw that into a machine learning algorithm and Jack Masty gave me the million dollars. <laughs> you know? you, it's harder to do that with animation or any other kind of nuance type thing, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> and so, so I'm like real, I'm holding on to my, Hold on to my dingleberries. <laughs> dingleberries. I'm holding on to my britches. Just like I'm like bracing for impact because it's gonna it's gonna happen suddenly, you know, and it's gonna be intense. Um, and it's not just like that, like even tech jobs, like a lot of even what programmers and tech guys, a lot of that stuff's gonna be automated too. It's pretty crazy how much is gonna be automated. People are worried about the truck drivers and shit like that. That's just gonna be the most obvious and most uh, immediate type of thing that's going to happen, like those kind of real basic jobs. But like people think, well, my job's safe. It's like, no, even like just anything that you can think of that is a repetitive action or it takes very, uh, very limited creative real, real estate to do, it's going to be, it's going to be gone, dude. And that's real sketch. Yeah. I, I think uh, machine learning is actually going to help people like us, like concept artists, like idea creators. Because then we don't need to model and animate. We don't need to learn all that stuff. We'll just use our ability to understand design and aesthetics um, and style uh, more aggressively than a machine learning algorithm. And we'll just use the, the, it as a tool, if that makes sense. It'll be more of like a valuable tool to concept artists than it will be to anybody else. The world will just be full of concept artists making all the content. Or artists that are, are, are like creatives. This is why I subscribe to a mostly socialized agenda, just because uh, it's pragmatic. Like, I get it, man. Like, nobody, like, don't tread on me. I get it. But, dude, the machines are treading. Like, we, we, we think of a Terminator, like, the machines are going to come and shoot us and uh, kill us or whatever. No, they're just going to take our jobs <laughs> and make us fight against ourselves. They're going to cause civil unrest. And it'll, it's it's not like machines will start shooting us. It's machines will have no concept of their own destruction of, against us, right? Like um, like the way that I like to think about it is uh, imagine that you made like a machine learning algorithm, okay? And and you you basically plugged in the machine algorithm and said, look, this is all you need to do. Just keep finding the most efficient way to get energy, okay? So we're thinking, this is great. And, and we just basically plug it into the internet. We plug it into everything. It has access to all of our machines, all of our tools, you know, completely autonomous. It, it would start off, let's say, building solar plant panels. Maybe it'll start building uh, renewable energies. Maybe like it'll discover how to create really safe nuclear plants and all this kind of stuff and how to dispose of the waste, right? And we're like, dope. Now we got almost unlimited amount of energy and our carbon emissions have gone down but we forgot to unplug the machine. So the machine's like, well, the next step is to build larger satellites and build larger, larger materials. So let's go ahead and start mining asteroids and all that stuff, you know? So they're gonna build rockets to send to the asteroids, start mining them to get more raw material, you know? And we're like, okay, that's kind of weird. Like it's going a little excessive, but you know what? We like it because we're humans and we're lazy. And if someone's doing work for us, we're all happy, you know? And then it's like, well, why we stop there? Like there's even more efficient way to get energy. I want to make other machine learning algorithms and robots that their whole job is that they're going to fly closer to the sun and start mining Venus and Mercury and basically creating a Dyson sphere. And at this point, it'll be, it'll be a runaway effect and there's nothing we can do about it. And now they're basically engulfing the sun, these robots, and destroying our solar system as a consequence. And then it'll just keep going and it'll just build another spaceship to fly into another solar system and just keep 
eating stars until it starts eating black holes and all that stuff. You know what I mean? It will be like creating a virus that doesn't stop, you know? But it wouldn't know that it's, it killed us. You know, it's not doing it because it's like, fuck humanity. It's doing it because it has one sole mission. Does that make sense? <clears throat> That's scary. Yeah, there's a, there's, a hy- there's, a, there's a hypothesis or a theory about why it's so, why the universe seems so scarce of life, right? Um, oh, I forget the name of it, but it's, it's oh, the, the uh, Fermi paradox. Uh, because some scientist was like, his name's Fermi, and he's like, he came up with this paradox of like, why isn't there life? Like, we, we should be seeing it often, actually, right? Um, and he explains because of just how massive the universe is and all that stuff. Like, there's, there's, there should be some semblance of life. Either we either the very first, which is very unlikely, or um, we are doomed. There is like an ultimate doom that no life can ever go past. All right. Like there's like, like no intelligent life can ever get past a very certain breaking point, you know? And there's a lot of ways that this can happen. One, one of the most obvious one is like self-destruction, but it could also be like, maybe there's this one high overlord space aliens that are always watching, right? And they're acting as conservationists. So imagine what's happening in the Amazon right now, how it's on fire, Right. Like, imagine if we were like, okay, like, we're going to do something about it, and we stop it, we, we destroy the fire with water, and all we put like, a lot of resources, we stop it. But let, let's, let's use actually a different example, like something like, um, like an Ebola bre- outbreak, right? So Ebola comes out, and so we quarantine the area, right? And we kill the disease, we stop it in its track before it really spreads further, you know? So what if this alien species, that's pretty much what they're doing, they're just looking and waiting and making sure the virus doesn't spread. In this case, it's humans, <laughs> okay? And human technology. And we get to a certain point, and then they'll quarantine our solar system until we kill ourselves off. Does that make sense? Uh, that's part of, like, one theory of the Fermi paradox. In fact, that's such a cool idea. I came up with, like, a story, a movie idea based off of that premise. Because I think that's such a cool concept, you know? That we are just a virus, and we are being quarantined. And that's why we're being destroyed. Not because of like alien, uh, it'll be a good twist on like alien invasion movies, right? It's like, no, imagine that we're Ebola. And these aliens are like, before this Ebola starts eating stars, (laughs) because that's the ultimate end of this, right? (laughs) We're going to stop it in its track. And uh, I think that's such a cool concept. You know, it's really, feels very unique. I don't think anyone's ever thought of that kind of movie idea. Uh, There's all sorts of stuff. like uh, our technology kills ourselves, we maybe make the most epic antib- uh, antibodies, right? Like the best uh, disease killing uh, medicine, but it, it kills so good, it even kills all the good bacteria in our body and it's like uncontrollable and then it eventually kills all of us, right? It's like, it's like bleach, if that makes sense. Like bleach really does a good job of cleaning, but it also can kill you if you drink it. <laughs> like it, it's, ultimately, it's ultimately cleaning too much, you know? and so um there's all sorts of things yeah just look it up the fermi paradox and you can see all the fascinating ways that we'll fucking kill ourselves <laughs> one of the more optimistic ones is that we're, it's just space is just too big like it's just impossible to reach each other you know like especially with the constant expanding universe it's like the distance that we would need to close is getting bigger and bigger and with the resources that are available to an intelligent sentient species, uh, they, it's just not possible to, to reach each other. It's like quite physically impossible. That's also another potential. So, you know, right now we're sending uh, satellites to I think Titan and some other moons in our solar system to larger planets. And there's a, there's a fear that if you find life, which I have a strong feeling we will, uh, find life on these planets, then the Fermi paradox becomes more of a reality. Meaning it's, it's actually more to be more, you should actually be more scared that we find life easily in other places that feel like life shouldn't exist. Because that, 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 that then means that life is not only is it really not hard for life to kind of exist out in the craziest circumstances, that 
intelligent life seems to be completely void in our solar system, our universe. And it may almost ultimately mean that we cannot get past what they call the great filter, the filter to rule them all. Such a fascinating concept. Holy shit. Yeah, look into all this stuff. It's really cool. It's really, really uh, ex existential <laughs> crisis, <laughs> right? As a human being, you're just like, fuck, why am I even trying to be a Commodore? Like, but this is like super far into the future. I don't think we'll have to worry about this kind of stuff. We have more immediate problems, um, but it's just a cool concept. And it's like things that us artists should evolve on, make cool stories around and make cool imagery to get people thinking about it, you know? But uh, yeah, machines are gonna take our jobs. So yeah, keep keep doing stuff that is hard to do um, in in the in a real way. But uh, on that note of machines taking our jobs, <laughs> uh, how how endangered do you think illustration is? Like the type of splash art kind of illustration, I, think I mean, or I think book illustration right. or stuff. Like that. I think they'll do all right for the same reasons. Like you can't steal someone's style, right? Well, no, but I guess a machine could ultimately learn all the possible, I don't know, compositional rules and ways to frame something and Absolutely. put a character in it. It I could have know. its own style, a good invented style. Yeah. That's, that's something that is something that I'd be really scared about for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Because the illustration might need have to that. Create. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think illustration is yeah. I, I specifically mentioned concept art because I do believe that is harder still, um, mm -hmm. and but like ultimately you can learn all the all the fundamentals of concept art. You can do all that foundational knowledge, and then you can feed in like a lot of different artists for the machine to kind of like become its own version, like own style that could be really dope. But like if you like the way that I paint specifically, you cannot take that. And I think illustration yeah. might somewhat be saved from that as well. But, but at the same time, there are people that just jack each other's style. Um, and it's pretty, it's, it's, it's okay. And so, and it's going to be a hard thing to kind of, it, I don't know how it's going to be settled in court, but I can tell you right now that there are courts that do settle these things and in the favor of the artist. Because at the end of the day, we are humans, and we try, we do try to take care of ourselves in this regard, in some oh, cases, yeah. you know. Yeah, I don't know how. I, I really don't know how it's going to happen. Because if I was that smart, then I would be doing. I'm doing all sorts of things, like learning how to program, learning game design, uh, being an uh, even better concept artist. You know, like I'm, a, I'm not banking on just one skill. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm hoping that one of the many skills that I've acquired in the last five years will, will be still really relevant. Right now it is. And one of those skills, again, would be teaching. Teaching is a very valuable um, resource of mine that I have. But again, that could change too. I was just watching Proko talk about how AI can start teaching people too. And I agree. I agree that this yeah. is possible. Especially for fundamental stuff, there's a lot more value there. Like it can teach you how to get your perspective better. It can even like make better tests. Not you sure really about creativity. Think so? Cause yeah, because uh, perspective is very mathematical, especially. Like you, you can look at your image and see that your vanishing points. Like you would just say, okay, this is where I think the horizon line should be in my image, and then the machine can figure out, like, okay, well then this image, this this building is out of perspective. This is out of perspective. This is out. You know, it can correct it for you. And you'd be like, oh, okay, shit. All right, I gotta fix that. All right? It might not give you the philosophy and the, the fundamentals of uh, purpose of why you should correct it. All right? That's why something like what I would do would be, will still have a lot of value. Right? But <clears throat> if you're just trying to learn how to get better at perspective and you want someone to critique your work that knows perspective, the machine can do that. Proportions too, it can do that for that. Anatomy too. Yeah, but I mean, beyond that, like uh, you get to know each one of your students like to, you get to you get to understand him on a personal level somewhat. yeah <clears throat> so that's why a machine saying. could never do that that's well it can or eventually it. <laughs> it can it's just i am very careful with my words when i say this and i say 
our jobs are going to be one of the last jobs to go. And when that yeah. happens, we better get our <laughs> shit together. We better have like great social programs and great social s- system. And the machines are self autonomous and uh, self reliant and autonomous. That it's like the movie Wally. You know how like the machines pretty much take care of the humans. But mm-hmm. unlike Wally, where it has a p- pessimistic outlook on that whole thing, it, it could be optimistic, where we've just designed the machines to a point of just being our slaves. But they don't know that they're slaves. They're just machines, right? And they would do all the kind of stuff. And it will actually allow us to just live as an animal now without worrying about food, <laughs> without worrying about <laughs> prospering, you know? Like we would just be able to do whatever the fuck we want with our life every day because we don't have to work. You know, we don't have to do any of that stuff, you know? There is, that is a possibility. But that can't exist if we have capitalism as the main driver for a lot of this stuff because there's no profit incentive to keep people happy you know yeah like like i remember uh, i mentioned to you guys like with facebook like the algorithm right facebook keeps you there whether you like it or not <laughs> you know it's important you understand the whether you like it or not part of that <laughs> sentence you know they'll keep you there if you constantly argue and bicker with people they're like yes send them more of that send them more <laughs> content like this you know and so there's no profit in just making you happy. There's a profit in keeping you there. Yep. If making you happy is part of the main part of what makes you stay there, then you do that. But obviously this is not true. Like some of the greatest and most damaging things in our societies have been dr- driven by capitalism, right? Like if you think about like the health crisis in America, like people are overweight because it's cheaper and easier to make garbage as meat and food and sell it for like a buck, you know, and it's delicious. Remember I was talking about the intuition of humans. Like this is another one of those examples of, yeah, tasting fats and sugars and salts is really good for us on a physiological level, because those are the foods that really keep us hydrated. It keeps us to store energy for future in case of starvation situations. Like we have no food for like a couple of days, you know, and carbohydrates is what feels like sugars is what feels our energy and uh, makes our mind clear. But when you have an abundance of fat, sugar, and salt, your body doesn't know any better. Our bodies have not evolved to understand <laughs> that this is too much, right? They just know we need it. This is great, you know? And you're like, yeah, this is great. And then you just keep eating that shit. And then you end up with diabetes, heart attack. You can literally have your heart like surgery and still keep eating that garbage. People do it all the fucking time, you know? Do you think McDonald's is, like, really looking out for you? They're not, you know? They know you'll, you'll keep on buying their fucking shitty-ass food. And so it's, it's, it's we kind of have to, like, at some point respond to this, this kind of, like, uh, epidemic, you know? And right now, it's not looking great. It's not look like we're making, like, as a humanity, it's not like we're making all the right moves. It looks like the Fermi paradox is in, all, in full effect. <laughs> the great filters upon us, you know? And so, um, uh, but I am optimistic. I have to be. I have children and I love them. I want them to grow up in a world that they can hopefully help change or be part of the change that's already happening. But anyway, not to leave the class on a pessimistic note. <laughs> well, so what's the purpose, bro? What's the purpose? <laughs> Uh, I just want you guys to be intelligent. You know, there's this really um, great um, quote um, where it was in The Walking Dead. It was, it was super dope. Where the guy says that, um, you know, the optimist always looks to the sky. And so when the, when the earth uh, shatters or when the hole beneath him surfaces, he falls into it, you know? Um, and then he, then the same thing he said, um, the pessimistic always looks to the ground looking for the holes, but misses the opportunities that are in the sky and even potentially runs into something that hits his head, you know? But the realist looks straight so they can see the positives and the negatives, right? He can see the opportunities and the pitfalls, right? And I like to think that uh, I'm, I'm more uh, optimistically realistic, meaning that I do still have my head in the clouds a bit. But I also do recognize that we're fucking up. <laughs> and it's, it's real bad, dude. You know? 
And so I, I encourage you guys to kind of have the same philosophy or, or even expand on that. Because if we only have a pessimistic uh, outlook, then we're, we're all fucked because nobody's, that means you just give up, right? And if we have a fully optimistic uh, perspective, that means nothing's wrong. Everything's great, right? <laughs> Things aren't great. The Amazon's on fire. Like literally, it's on fire right now as we speak. <laughs> Things are not great. <laughs> Anyway, any other questions? Um, could you take a look at the uh, the thing I posted in the Skype chat? I finished up my uh, image. Ooh, yes, I can take a look. Hold on, give me a second. Oh, is this the one that you wanted me to see earlier? Yeah. Nope, garbage. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> Machine can draw that. No problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <Just man. kidding. laughs> like, oh, cool. Then. The age is a great teacher, but then the last day, dude, he just like really like turned on his students. <laughs> um, it's really blurry. I can't really see it entirely, oh. but I get, I get the gist of what's happening here. Yeah. I mean, like nothing has changed. I think you're still on the right track. It is. It seems to me you're, you're right too. You're getting, it's getting easier for you to kind of do this. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you, dude. Um, wait, hold on, just a second. I heard a beep. I think that's someone else, but I just remember. I know it was for me. Yeah. Yeah, but that did that did remind me to check the laundry, and I think it just oh. gave <laughs> one second, and I'll I'll finish my comment here. Okay. Yeah, I'm back. Hey, I'm back. Hey. I think I need to. I think I need to put another towel in there. This is my wife's shoes, and it's like thumping like crazy. Yeah, let me throw more stuff in there. Give me one second. back yeah you're on, you're on the right track though i wouldn't worry too much uh i think you're doing good just uh okay. keep yeah keep uh keep trucking okay cool cool indeed uh, i have a question about your private uh, club do you um do you still have that yeah, but it's not really as, as advertised. And I think I need to change that. And essentially, like, I was saying that there's like workshops and stuff. That's ultimately not true. 
Uh, but all the other stuff is like you get access to all the tutorials and all everything like that's still kind of in effect. But do you get to critique the work? Like that's what I'm saying. That part is not like because that's just not sustainable for me, and that's why I need to like change that whole thing. Yeah. But uh, it's just because yeah, it's just not. Uh, I just like that would need to be like a full time job is to run the club and right now the club isn't as lucrative as I was expecting. And so I just kind of left it open just so that people can like still get those tutorials, but I just need to re-advertise it to that so that people know what they're getting into. But ultimately, if you want all the tutorials, then yeah, it's, it's available for you. Some people still do it. They get like the lifetime just so they can get all that. And it's all future tutorials too. That's still true. So if I make, because I do make tutorials seasonally, like every like several months, I like make a lot of new tutorials and I put it on uh, my site and you'll just have access to that. Awesome. The link to your public discord doesn't work anymore on your website. Shut up. That's, no, oh, okay. <laughs> just, <laughs> you should keep digging it. All right, cool. Later. <laughs> yeah, I'll look into that. That, that definitely should not be uh not working that should definitely be working that's a static thing i don't know why that's the case static as in like i don't need to be there to always <laughs> make sure you can join that but to be honest i need to like just revitalize the discord too so maybe i'll like when i think of ultimately the solution to all this i'll just do it all and if you're already part of the club you'll just know so I have all everybody's emails, so I'll just be able to like, all right, guys, this is what's happening. Okay. Bless you. Thank you. It's inside. Thank you. Uh, I've got another question. Um, do you have any like, I don't know, quick tips on how to? Uh, maintain a I don't know a healthy mindset and to just in general so yeah yeah okay because it's it's more and more clear to me that it's a very relevant thing to to be I don't know work properly as a human and having a good mindset helps with this yeah, uh, I think exercising, eating right, surrounding yourself with a, a good social circle. You know, there's like this this idea you're the sum of the f like five people you surround yourself with. I agree with this pretty uh, intensely. I think that's true. Mostly, like if you surround yourself with a bunch of whiners and complainers, then you will also become one. And then if you surround yourself with a bunch of go getters and positive influences then you will also be a part of that because if you are amongst complainers then you'll just be another one of the complainers right and it's just mm -hmm. like nobody knows um but if you're a part of a bunch of people that are like um forward thinking then you will be the odd person out right like you'll be the one that's like always complaining about shit and most people don't like to hang around that anyway uh, i think it's one thing to be realistic it's another thing to to um, <clears throat> to just be nihilistic about everything. Like th this is partly why, like in 2017, I stopped kind of arguing and fighting with people all the time. Like right now, I posted that thing, and and people, I'm sure like some some Barcelona, I don't know how to say his name, but the guy, the president of Brazil right now. Like, I'm sure these are some of the, his sympathizers or people that may have voted for him or think that he's doing a good job, right? Uh, the equivalent for me in the States would be like uh, a Trump supporter, right? And so to me, it's like, like you do understand, like, I, I just never understand this. Like, like you, you have to respect that we are fucking things up. Like there's, there's really, it's really hard to deny, even on an intuitive level, you can you can see it, true, right? And so, yeah. but like this is also true on the other side of the equation, right? So there's people who are, let's say, on the on the more left leaning political sphere, 
who complain a lot too about everything. Like everything is racist. Everything is misogynistic. <laughs> and that's not true either. You know, <laughs> it just isn't. But is there racism? Yes, of course. Is there misogyny? Yes, duh. But like, once you say everything is this, right? Then I start to kind of double, double check what you, why you think this so, so much like that, right? Yeah. Like, like when a person says everything's fake news, then I double check that. I'm like, well, how do you know that the news that you listen to is not fake news, right? Mm -hmm. So, what is your metric for? not fake news you know right. like, if your main argument is the mainstream media is like they have an agenda they have their biases i will say that that's actually true but just because someone has a bias or an agenda doesn't mean that what they're saying isn't true right right like mm -hmm. a conservative could say yes the global climate change is a problem but i don't think solar and wind is the solution and all this like bleeding heart liberal shit is stupid but they but they recognize the climate is changing and they say maybe nuclear power is a good effective tool and it is if you disagree with it or not right and vice versa like a, a bleeding heart liberal might say something like well we need to just go super green like never use plastic and do all this like hardcore stuff stop eating meat mm -hmm. none of that's not true either like, that's also true and that's why we need to like reasonable conservatives and reasonable liberals to argue with each other not the extremes of each arguing with each other because the extremes don't know what the fuck they're talking about. You know, they go way too full tilt. And, um, but like to the surrounding yourself, I was surrounding myself to the hardcore uh, position of one, one group of people. And it was the group of people who whine a lot. And I was just feeling like anxious. I'd never feel anxious uh, for the first time ever. And I didn't like it. And so I was very, it was very, it was very clear to me like what was going on. So I just immediately distanced myself from that. Uh, I still complain and I still make arguments, but now it's more like if there's something that I generally think is fucked up, I will talk about it. Before it was like everything. I was trying to find something to be mad about. Right. And I'm like, well, then in that case, I'm always going to be mad because there's always something to be mad about. Right. And I got kids, man. And I got like friends and family that I care about. I can't be that guy. You know, I got students, I got people in my life that I care deeply about. I need to be a positive influence to them, not a negative one. So that's why I highly encourage you surround yourself with the same kind of people that you think are going to make your life better, not make it worse. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you have people in your life that you really love and respect, but then you just don't really want to hang out with them because of certain reasons. For instance, um, I have a really close friend, like they're actually really good. We, we like hanging out with them but their kid's a real asshole, so we don't hang out with them and their kid. Like, they'll invite us to birthday parties and little events that they have, and I'm like, nope, hard pass, dude. And um, it's not the kid's fault either. It's mostly their fault. And we told them that, too. We're like, it's your fault. Your kid's an asshole. And uh, <laughs> nobody likes to hear that, but it's true. Their kid, like, ruined their wedding. Like, she was supposed to be their flower girl, and then the day of, she was just like, meow, meow. I want to go home. And it's like, Jesus. she was not budging. And, and you know, it's bad. Like even when the immediate family is like this little bitch, you know, <laughs> like all like the uncles and aunts and the grandmas are just like motherfucking, you know, like you could see it in their face. Everyone's just like, God damn it. You know? So they didn't have a flower girl and they, Whoa. yeah. Like, cause they're not strict enough with her. Jeez. Yeah, we had a real conversation with them. I'm like, this is how entitled people are invented. <laughs> Where do you think they come from? Man? <laughs> and um, yeah, they didn't like that response. But we're so close with them. They, we still hang out with them, just not with their daughter. <laughs> She's <laughs> a real asshole. Like, she uh, trapped my daughter once in uh, her room and laughing was laughing. She's like a straight bully. Dude. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard, dude, because we love them. They're actually really good people. It's just they're like, too spoilish to their one daughter it's crazy yeah. and they're not listening to our reason but anyway uh so we don't surround our daughter with their daughter is what i'm saying because yep. uh, their daughter is a clear negative influence to her so anyway uh and yeah working out is scientifically been proven to help you out right because it 
pumps your blood, it gets more oxygen to your body. Uh, it feeds your mind in a way that you might not expect. Yeah. Right, it's all connected. People think that mind and body are different. Now they're the same. They're all part of the one body. We, we've just invented those two, two terms, the uh, mental versus physical. But technically your brain is also physical, you know? Like if I take a hammer to your arm, I break your arm. If I take a hammer to your brain, I break your brain. <laughs> It's not like a different, I need to use a different tool to kill your brain. No, the same tool works. <laughs> you, know? Sure. Uh, you know, when you form memories, it's like pro proteins and, and such, you know? Yeah. Electrical p impulses. It's physics and biology. These are all physical attributes, you know? And so when you work out, it's, it's contributing to your overall health, not just like your immediate biceps are getting bigger or whatever. Like everything is getting better if you eat right everything's getting better you are less anxious you're less um well you might still have it but you're, you're just less of it you're more you have days where you are thinking less about that kind of stuff you know but if you don't do any of this stuff your body is imagine your body is just running on fumes so it's like the last thing it wants to do is just like deal with anything so it's just constantly like anxious you know because it's running on fumes and i mean like i'm not talking about like eating a lot of food i'm talking about eating good foods Right? If you're eating bad food and eating a lot of it, your body will still feel like it's starving. That's why you have like this insatiable hunger. Like, you keep eating snacks and eating all this stuff. Your body's like, where the fuck's the nutrition, dude? Where the fuck is the nutrition, dude? <laughs> you know, it's getting bad, dude. And it doesn't know what to do. Because your conscious and subconscious mind are like, no, nah, dude, like we're biologically built to just keep eating. But in this like, you know, world that we live in, it doesn't make sense to eat that much. <clears throat> yeah so yeah health and mind and all that stuff is really important uh i think uh again surrounding yourself is really important too like even if you can't do it physically even like online hangouts that works really well you know just just find, oh. yeah, be a problem solver right like i've talked about in the past yeah man see you later tire i'm actually gonna end the class now see you later too. man, man. man. A, a lengthy q a session yeah. bye but, uh, but I will say, yeah, we should all roll out now. It's been an honor, though. I appreciate all of you guys. You guys have all been really great. Keep up the positive energies. Keep up working hard and, and consistently. And next thing you know, you'll be working at your guys' dream locations. And then you guys might do the things you guys care about. But also remember the things that are very important to you. So that way you don't get trapped in this constant chasing of, like, success. Because that also could be really detriment to your health. Um, but with that being said, take care, friends. I hope you guys all have a great day. And I'll talk to you guys when I talk to you guys. Peace out. Peace. Bye-bye. Can't Peace. thank you enough, AJ. Appreciate it's it. Man. Man. It's been an honor. Talk to you guys later. See ya. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.